Hello, my name's Roisin and I'm sick of reading. Hello friends, I recently did a video where I shared with you my top 10 favourite historical fiction novels and that got me thinking. I really enjoyed making that video and sharing with you some of the books that I love so much and so I thought it would be good to share with you some of my favourite books from a different genre that I love and that is classic literature. Now for the purposes of this video I have considered classic literature to be any novel published before 1950. If you would like to see a video on my favourite modern classics please leave a comment down below and I would love to do that for you. Most of the novels on my list are from the 19th and early 20th century because that's what I have the most experience reading and because I think that those are the most accessible classic novels for the modern reader. If you have any recommendation of any pre-1800 novels that you think I would really enjoy, I would love to hear those too. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more recommendations of my favourite books. But without further ado, let's get into my top 10 classic novels. Number one on my list is Persuasion by Jane Austen. Jane Austen always ends up on lists like this and for good reason. She is the master of both romantic plots and biting social satire. Her books are light and fun but at the same time witty reflections of the social mores of the time and the position of women in Regency England. Pride and Prejudice is probably her most famous novel but for this list I thought I would highlight one of her more one of her slightly lesser known novels, not that any Jane Austen is really lesser known, um, but one that I think could be considered to be more complex. Eight years before the start of the events of the novel Persuasion, Anne Elliot was proposed to by John Wentworth and she was happily betrothed until her friend Lady Russell persuaded her that Captain Wentworth was beneath her uh, and so she was persuaded to break off that engagement. But she has held on to the regret of that decision for the past eight years of her life. As the novel opens, the Elliots are down on their luck and having to move out of their stately home in the countryside to a smaller house in Bath because of the profligate spending of the older sister and the mismanagement of Anne Elliot's father. It is, in fact, Wentworth's sister who becomes the tenant of the house. Wentworth himself has been has made his fortune in the Navy and is back in England. The novel revolves around whether Anne and Wentworth will rekindle their love or if it has gone beyond saving. Jane Austen's detailed character work and sharp ironic observation are on full display in this novel, but added to that is a deep sense of longing and melancholy. This is perhaps the most melancholic of all Austen novels and somehow feels more emotionally complex as this was the last completed novel that she published. The over-the-top women and silly men still abound and it is still a comic novel, but it is more beautiful, more lyrical and perhaps even more romantic than any of the other Austen novels. And the ending is one of the most beautiful and intense love letters in fiction. I can no longer listen in silence. I must speak to you by such means as are within my reach. You pierce my soul. I am half agony, half hope. Tell me that I am not too late, that such precious feelings are not gone forever. I offer myself to you with a heart even more your own than when you broke it almost eight years and a half ago. Number two is North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. I have heard this referred to as Pride and Prejudice for Socialists. It is similar to Jane Austen in the will they won't they longing looks, romance and the social commentary. It feels far more political and it is one of the first novels of the Industrial Revolution to deal with conflict between workers and employ employers. Jane Austen never really dealt with working class in her books, but in although they are not the main characters of North and South, the lives of the working class are pivotal to the plot. Margaret Hale has to leave her family home when her father, who had been a vicar, leaves the church because of a crisis of conscience. They move to the North and initially Margaret is repulsed, as her mother is, by the shabby nature of Milton, the town to which they have moved, compared to the pastoral idyll in which she was raised. But Margaret becomes aware of the poverty and suffering of the mill workers in the town and develops a passionate sense of social justice. Her father at the same time becomes a mentor and friend for one of the mill owners, John Thornton, with whom, Mar with whom Margaret clashes over the treatment of the workers and in whom she finds an intense attraction. The use of Margaret Hale as a genteel outsider becoming aware of the conditions of the working class is powerfully effective in this novel, bringing a deep empathy to the working classes who were often left out of literature of the time. But it is also a really 
really accessible way to learn about the beginnings of the labour movement in the UK, although it does ignore how cotton came to be in the north of England in the first place. On top of that, it is also a romantic novel of passion and misunderstandings, of lingering accidental touches and longing looks. He could not forget the touch of her arms around his neck, impatiently felt as it had been at the time. But now the recollection of her clinging defence of him seemed to thrill him through and through, to melt away every resolution all power of self-control, as if it were wax before a fire. Number three is I Capture the Castle by Dodie Smith. I read this novel when I was about 13 and I have read it again over and over, identifying strongly with the main character Cassandra Mortmain. This often ends up classified as children's fiction. I don't know if that's I don't know if that's because it deals with two girl, two women who are 17 and 20 or because Dodie Smith was also the author of 101 Dalmatians, but I consider it something closer to Sense and Sensibility or Little Women than a true children's novel. Although perhaps you could consider it a YA novel even though teenagers weren't really a concept when this book was written. It also has one of the most one of those brilliant f opening lines that really symbolizes what the novel is like as a whole. I write this sitting in the kitchen sink. Cassandra Mortmain lives in a tumble-down castle with her oddball family. Her father wrote one brilliant experimental novel years before, think along the lines of James Joyce, and bought the castle when he was flying high but hasn't published anything since and has been living off royalties which have over the years petered out. The family are penniless when their landlord dies and his two young American grandsons come to take over their inheritance. Cassandra and her sister Rose are both hopelessly romantic and naive and see these men as their way out of penury. What I love about this novel is that it never goes the way you think it's going to go. Cassandra and Rose love Jane Austen and they think that these men will be the way to turn their lives into an Austen novel. One of them even says, I wish I were in a Jane Austen novel. It is similar to Jane Austen in that you have the odd cast of characters, although I don't think Jane Austen would have ever written a stepmother who was once an artist's model and likes to go out and commune with nature in the in the nude. And it also has the rich and handsome men who happen to drop into their lives. But it turns out that real relationships, real feelings, are not like those in a novel. And people are more complex than Rose and Cassandra imagine. The novel is more about families and how it feels to be 17 and uncertain, to be, to be living a life in your imagination. The novel is told as Cassandra's diary and she often writes how she thinks things will go or how she plans and wants things to go. But nothing ever quite works out. Also, there's a very funny scene with fur coats and a bear chase. When I read a book, I put in all the imagination I can, so that it is almost like writing the book as well as reading it. Or rather, it is like living it. It makes reading so much more exciting. But I don't suppose many people try to do that. Number four is The Odyssey by Homer, the ultimate classic literature as it is one of the oldest extant works of fiction. This one is kind of a cheat because it's not really a novel, it's an epic poem, but since my copy is over 300 pages I'm going to consider it a novel. Greek and Latin literature can be a bit tricky if you haven't studied them because uh, the, their culture, the culture of Greece 2000 plus years ago is so different from the way we live now and their understanding of um, plot and story is very different from the way that we um, understand those things now. But if you do want to get into Greek and Roman literature, I think that the Odyssey is one of the most accessible places to start. Troy has fallen and the Greeks have won, but travelling the Mediterranean can be almost as treacherous as a war, especially when not all of the gods are on your side. Odysseus has been gone from home for nearly 20 years at the opening of this poem, and Penelope, his wife, and Telemachus, his son, have been left alone to defend the house from a horde of suitors who have descended. Penelope is only able to refrain from marrying one of them through her own wit and cleverness. Odysseus has been trapped on an island with Circe, captured by Cyclopses, and faced Sirens and Scylla and Charybdis, and gone to the underworld and come back. We hear him telling all of these stories, as Odysseus is famous for his stories. But how will he regain his home once he returns, and has his wife truly been faithful to him? Ah, oh, how shameless! The way these mortals blame the gods! From us alone, they say, come all their miseries. Yet but they themselves, and their own reckless ways, compound their pains beyond their proper share. Number four is Brideshead Revisited by Evelyn Waugh. 
most classics are about posh people sometimes with a slightly less posh every man as our way into this world and this novel is no exception it definitely is one of those novels that people read and then become obsessed with become drawn into the whole aesthetic of the thing kind of like the secret history i definitely think there are brideshead revisited overtones in the secret history so if you like that one you might like this one this is a campus novel set at oxford in the 1930s uh, so it definitely has that neo gothic light academia vibe going for it. Uh, the novel is spent mostly in the interwar period but is actually told through a series of flashbacks. Um, the main character Charles Ryder is an officer during the Second World War who has reconnoitred a house for the use of the army and that house happens to be the house that he visited in the 1930s with because it belonged to the family of his friend Sebastian. It flashes back to when he first went up to Oxford, a boy from a middle class background, meeting all of these fabulous posh landed gentry people, drawn into the allure of this charming rich man, man Sebastian Marchmain. He goes to say at, his, at this boy's family home and is overawed by his family, his powerhouse of a mother and his cold and distant sister, the beauty of the house and the strangeness of their Catholic faith. He, see, he becomes drawn to them and disgusted by them in equal measure and sees the way that they do eventually close ranks. I know that in America, middle class means something more like working class means in the UK. So in, in order to understand Charles Ryder's position, if you are from the US, um, middle class would be someone who was something like a lawyer or a doctor or a um, accountant. Middle class people generally have a profession. I suppose the bourgeois would be the best way to translate the middle classes. This novel is so beautifully written. You you become enraptured with the Marchmains in the same way that Charles Ryder is. Intrigued, confused, slightly repulsed by their weird behaviour. You feel their charm and also their carelessness, the way that they can hurt people without it seeming to touch them. It is also a queer novel, clearly as a novel could be in the time in which it was published. Queer men's lives could be in the 1930s and 40s. It is a novel all about aesthetics and it definitely has that still otherworldly vibe of a lot of novels of this period. If you asked me now who I am, the only answer I could give with any certainty would be my name. For the rest, my loves, my hates, down even to my deepest desires, I can no longer say whether these emotions are my own or stolen from those I once so desperately wished to be. Five on my list is Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. I feel like this is a novel that is often misunderstood, uh, especially by those who have been forced to study it in school because it is advertised wrongly, I suppose. Some people may just not like it and that is fine, but I do feel that a lot of people expect it to be a romance in the same way as Jane Austen is and for Kathleen Heathcliff to be a relationship that you want to work and you want those people to be together um, in the same way that you do Darcy and Lizzie or Anne and Captain, w Captain Wentworth. And then people feel a bit confused by how tempestuous this novel is and by the second half of the book especially. But this book is romantic in the capital R sense of the word. The romantic period is the period in which the Brontes grew up, the work that they were influenced by and loved, the work that shaped them when they were forming their taste. And it is also set in 1801 and before, uh, which is during the height of the Romantic period, um, which actually m makes it a historical novel because it was published in 1849. So Romantic here means that it is focused on emotion and individualism, the beauty of nature and the sublime passion and nature and things that cannot be explained. I think if you go into it with that point of view, uh, an understanding of nature, uh, the wild emotions of human beings, um, the extremes, that can have a, that can colour your reading differently than if you go into it expecting a sort of slightly wild Pride and Prejudice. The novel begins in 1801 when our narrator, Mr Lockwood, rents a house from Heathcliff. Uh, from Heathcliff's servant Nelly, Lockwood hears the story of the house. And Mr Earnshaw, years before, had adopted the orphan boy Heathcliff, described as dark-skinned and hated by Cathy and her brother Henley when they first meet. But Cathy and Heathcliff soon become inseparable, obsessed with each other. But on Mr Earnshaw's death, Hindley inherits and sets Heathcliff to work as a labourer. Cathy and Heathcliff are still obsessed with each other and can go nowhere without each other, but they are also cruel. And one day they go off to bully their neighbours, the Lintons. But Cathy becomes injured and has to remain at the Linton household while she recovers. She changes in that time and ends up married to Linton. And Heathcliff vows to win her back 
back and when he can't to seek revenge on everybody this is a wild and beautiful novel no you don't like the characters you don't like any of them they're all terrible people but they feel so vividly alive and real the more itself is like another character in this novel and the descriptions of it are stunning it's a book you can become obsessed with and in its time it was also incredibly challenging challenging ideas of class and gender and race of christian hypocrisy and what it means to be truly moral if you like the romantic poets i would definitely give this novel a try if all else perished and he remained, I should still continue to be. And if all else remained and he were annihilated, the universe would turn to a mighty stranger. Number seven is Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. I grew up with this novel and with the 1994 version with Winona Ryder. I used to get the audiobook out on tape from the library and listen to it over and over and over again. I guess it falls into a similar place as I Capture the Castle. Um, the first half of the novel especially is almost a children's novel and then the second half less so. In the UK actually it was published as Little Women and Good Wives whereas in the US the two are together. There is a lot of morality in this book uh, and a lot of Christianity especially in the first half which is not something I generally get on with but I did but this novel holds such a cosy place in my heart. It's definitely one that I need to reread soon. Little Women is the story of four sisters during the American Civil War. Their father, Mr. March, has gone off to fight for the Union side in the war, and they are down on their luck because their father's school had to close when he admitted a black pupil. They are a progressive family and one who believes in hard work and in doing what you believe to be right. The second sister, Jo, is often described as a tomboy and wants to be a writer, and the sisters perform together plays that she has written. The story follows their misadventures and foibles as they grow from girls into little women and suffer through illnesses and loss fights and loves. This book is so cosy. It feels like a Christmas novel because it opens at Christmas and starts with that famous opening line. Christmas won't be the same without any presents, cried Jo, lying on the rug. Or sometimes it feels like an autumnal novel because of the beautiful New England setting. There are clear morals in this book, especially in the first half. It is a lot about lessons to be learned. But because the characters are based on people from Louisa May Alcott's life, they feel so incredibly real. They are not perfect, but they are also not dramatic. They seem to be struggling with real human things, even if they are not the biggest things in the world. And they do the best they can. I want to do something splendid. Something heroic or wonderful that won't be forgotten after I'm dead. I don't know what, but I'm on the watch for it and mean to astonish you all some day. Number eight is David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. I never thought I would like Dickens. My mother doesn't like Dickens. And there's a lot in the British media that takes the piss out of him for being so serious and dour and everything being really depressing and everything being relentlessly glum and depressing. The plots are often described as being everything's terrible and just when you think something's about to work out, something else terrible happens. But that wasn't my experience of reading David Copperfield. I listened to the audiobook. I stretched it out over the course of a few months, but I was pleasantly surprised by how much I liked this novel. David Copperfield is Charles Dickens' semi-autobiographical novel, and it starts with David Copperfield just before he is born, which happens a few months after his father has died. In the beginning, we are in the ha in a cosy, warm, loving household with him and his mother and his and their servant Peggotty, whom he loves. But eventually, his mother remarries and everything changes. Her husband, Mr. Murdstone, is abusive and uh, David Copperfield is abused relentlessly until he is eventually sent away to school where he is, continues to be abused. When his mother dies, he is taken out of school and put to work until eventually he runs away to find his aunt. And we see his life as he goes back to school and learns and becomes and gets a profession. And then as tragedy strikes again and again and again, each time he has to rebuild. It all sounds like such a dour, sombre novel, but in reality it is touched with so much humanity and wit and humour that the, that the tragedies don't feel underwhel overwhelming. What I remember most from this novel is a sense of affection. David Copperfield is a very affectionate character and he loves deeply the people in his lives. The Peggotties, um, his aunt Betsy Trotwood and her friend Mr Dick and his friends and although there is odd quirky behaviour that brings a lot of humour to the novel it is this sense of uh, familial love that is truly the strongest thing in the novel. The novel also spends time with the working class and with people in true poverty. It explores how the lazy fair system puts people in this position and keeps them there or once they fall into it makes it impossible to climb 
makes it almost impossible to climb out of. It also explores the hypocrisy and cruelty of the way the Victorian system treated women, but it does so with a very light hand. My meaning simply is that whatever I have tried to do in life, I have tried with all my heart to do well. And whatever I have devoted myself to, I have devoted myself to completely. That in great aims and in small, I have always been thoroughly in earnest. Number nine is A Room with a View by E.M. Forster. I seem to love these opposite attract romances and explorations of class in my classic novels. I didn't realise until I was making this list how much class really comes into my enjoyment of a novel and how much I love intense and yet understated relationships and beautiful descriptions of nature. Lucy has her rigid middle-class life mapped out for her until she visits Florence with her uptight cousin Charlotte and finds her neatly ordered existence thrown off balance. Eyes are opened by the unconventional characters at the Pensione Bortolini. Flamboyant romantic novelist Eleanor Lavish, the Cockney Signora, Curious Mr. Emerson, and most of all, his passionate son, George. Lucy finds herself torn between the intensity of her life in Italy and the repressed morals of Edwardian England, personified in her terminally dull fiancé, Cyril. I love the beautiful descriptions of the Italian countryside and the more quaint contained descriptions of Kent. This is a novel of Lucy's coming of age and the differences in the descriptions of the nat of nature between the Kent gardens and the wild Italian countryside, breaking out of the confined role she has been told she has to play. It's also a fairly comic novel and very light uh, and easy to read while still talking about these deep, serious themes. We cast a shadow on something wherever we stand. And it is no good moving from place to place to save things, because the shadow always follows. Choose a place where you won't do harm. Choose a place where you won't do very much harm. And stand in it for all you are worth, facing the sunshine. And the final novel on my list is Tess of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy. Another man with a penchant for suffering. <laughs> Everything that can go wrong does go wrong for Tess. But even so, I enjoyed this novel. I studied Thomas Hardy's poetry for my A-levels, and I loved the way he writes nature, which is something that he takes over into his novels as well. Similarly to Gaskell and Dickens, he ex his characters are working class characters, and that is where his fiction is grounded. But while Gaskell deals with the mill towns of the north and Dickens is in London, Hardy's characters are from the countryside, from Wessex, which is the southwest of England, Cornwall, Devon, Somerset, and Wiltshire. He also writes remarkably sympathetic and well-rounded portraits of women, which is quite a feat for a Victorian man, particularly one who abandoned his wife for a younger model. When Tess Derbyfield is driven by family poverty to claim kinship with the wealthy Derbervilles and seek a portion of their family fortune, meeting her cousin Alec proves to be disastrous. A very different man, Angel Clare, seems to offer her love and salvation, but Tess must choose whether to reveal her past or remain silent in the hope of a peaceful future. Never in her life, she could swear it from the bottom of her soul, had she ever intended to do wrong. Yet these harsh judgments had come. Whatever her sins, they were not sins of intention, but of inadvertence. And why should she have been punished so persistently? So that is all of my favourite classic novels that I have read. I know there are many more that I would love if I took the time to read them, and I also know that this list is not very diverse. They're all white and mostly all from England. So let me know what your favourites are in the comments, particularly if you have any suggestions for more diverse novels. Thank you for watching this video. Please give it a thumbs up if you liked it, and remember to subscribe because I will be back the day after tomorrow. Thank you for watching. Bye bye!